Hi everyone, I'm Lindsay and I'm completing my graduate anatomical sciences certificate here in the department and thank you guys for having me. Today I will be talking about the visual pathway, the anatomy, um, functional components, the visual field deficits that can arise based on lesions at different parts of the pathway, as well as the light reflex and pupillary response. So here we see basically the beginning of the visual pathway. The visual field extending out anterior to the body, so that's everything that we're perceiving in the environment around us. The stimulus then entering the eye, refracting at the cornea, and projecting onto the retinal fields of each eye. Notice that the entire visual field projects onto the entire retinal field of each eye separately. Something to also keep in mind here is the terminology that's being used. So it might be spoken of in terms of left and right, but it's also spoken of in terms of nasal, which would be closer to the midline, and temporal, which of course would be lateral. Um, and it's just important to pay attention to that because it's not necessarily always interchangeable. So now taking that concept to the actual view of what you're seeing when you're looking out into the visual field, we have a graph such as this and we conduct parametry um, and that just measures a patient's visual field. So their central acuity as well as their peripheral vision. So in this representation, you see the left eye, the right eye, the brow above, the cheek below, and the nose in the center. You also have your right visual field of each eye, which is nasal in this case and temporal in this case, and your left visual field of each eye, which again, we see nasal left and temporal left here. In addition, you have your macula, and this is the area in the visual field where your vision is most, you have the highest acuity, so it's the most precise. As you learned in a previous lecture, it is where we have um, the most cones in our eyes. And so this actually will correspond with the fovea centralis and the macula lutea. In addition to that, we have our blind spot, which is lateral to the macula. And this, of course, corresponds with the optic disc in the retina that is where the optic nerve exits with the associated neurovasculature. On the previous slide, we discussed that we have the um, left and right visual field, but we also have the superior and inferior vis visual fields for each eye. So you'll have a superior and inferior temporal field and a superior and inferior nasal field for each eye. And this separates them into quadrants, which will be useful for clinical diagnosis. And then here we have a patient who is having his visual field checked. And so he will, um, after going, undergoing this procedure, a chart will be produced much like what we're seeing here that will show if there are any deficits in the patient's visual field. So this arrangement is what allows for our overlapping visual fields or our binocular vision. When we're looking into the visual field, we have overlap. So we still see our macula central, our blind spots lateral, and notice we also still have all left visual field information going to the right retinal field of each eye and all right visual field information still going to the left retinal field of each eye. Now that we talked about the visual field and what's being perceived at the very beginning of the visual pathway, we can start talking about some of the anatomy in the more posterior aspect of the visual pathway. So we still see here, we've got our monocular fields to the periphery, got our binocular field and then our macula center. We have the stimulus coming in, refracting at the cornea, reaching the retinal fields. And then we see our optic nerve extending back, 
the optic chiasm, the optic tract, synapsing on both sides at the lateral geniculate nuclei, and then heading back, radiating back as optic radiations until their termination at the, um, the primary visual cortex of the occipital. So from the retina all the way through the pathway back to the occipital, we call them different names, of course, so we can talk about them in different ways, but it's all the, um, the retinal ganglion cells, the axons of the retinal ganglion cells is what is projecting back into the primary visual cortex. If we look here in the center at the optic chiasm, we know that the fibers cross because we were talking about that earlier with how they project the visual field. But notice that some of the fibers remain lateral. So the temporal fi fibers for both eyes are going to remain lateral. And it's the nasal fibers that cross in the center here. It's about 40% um, temporal and 60% is what crosses but I don't think that that's important to know at this point. Um, but yeah, so notice that the nasal fibers cross and then they extend up to their respective nasal fields. So now taking it a step further, we can look at this exact same setup, but in a more three-dimensional way. So we still see the familiar structures here. We've got our visual field out in front. We have our, um, there we go, sorry. We have our eyes and then our optic nerve heading back to our optic chiasm. Of course, in this case, we're seeing the separate fibers so that we can understand a little better what's happening with the image. And then from our optic chiasm, we go back through our optic tracts on each side to our lateral geniculate nuclei on each side. Now when we look at it in 3D, we can tell that once the fibers reach the lateral, lateral geniculate nucleus and exit posteriorly, they diverge into separate bundles. So this bundle here, which we'll call the lower bundle for now, is responsible for upper visual field, and that's called Myers loop. It swings out um, laterally around the the lateral ventricle, and then it proceeds back posteriorly. Then you also have another bundle of fibers that will go a bit superiorly before heading posterior. Those are, we can call them the upper bundle. Sometimes it's upper and central bundle, but for the class, we're calling it Baum's loop. And so Baum's loop uh, will, will run back and again then terminate in the primary visual cortex. Now, so basically we can see that posterior to the lateral geniculate nucleus, we're now dealing with up and down, whereas um, anterior to the lateral geniculate nucleus, we were just dealing with left and right. However, this is still important because we're still dealing with left and right, we're just now adding up and down. And so if we look here at the colors of these fibers, the left lower bundle, Myers loop, the left Myers loop is responsible for the right upper quadrant of each eye. Then we see that Baum's loop here is responsible for the right lower quadrant of each eye. And so when you're speaking in terms of things posterior to the lateral geniculate nucleus, you can think of them as always reversed and inverted, just totally flipped, which is representative here. You can see that it's completely reversed and inverted from that organization. Here's a lateral view of the very same thing. And in this, we can see here the lateral ventricle. We can see how that Myers loop, the lower bundle that's responsible for upper visual field is swinging out around the, um, the ventricle. But you can see here that from the eye all the way up to the lateral geniculate nucleus or body, um, lateral geniculate nucleus I think is the more specialized or more um, precise term to use. 
So we can see that it's all basically within an even plane. It's a flat plane from the eye back to the LGN. But then when you reach the LGN and the fibers, the optic radiations exit posteriorly, that's when we see them diverge significantly, but then they converge again when they reach the occipital cortex, the primary visual center. In dissection, I'm not sure whether y'all will be doing this or not, but in dissection, it's important to note that the Myers loop, the lower fibers, will come in beneath the calcarine sulcus and the upper fibers, Baum's loop, which again is lower visual field, are going to be superior to the calcarine sulcus. And then this here is just showing you again that it's, it's flipped from what you would expect. So up is down and down is up. Here we have a cadaver. Uh, it's been cut away so that you can see the optic radiations here coming back, quite beautiful actually. And so here's the optic nerve, optic chiasm, optic tract, lateral geniculate nucleus, roughly. And then we can see that some are going lower because we're looking at an inferior view here. Some are going down lower and some are swinging up higher, but they're all coming back here to the same location. And here also note, um, we're gonna be talking here about the midbrain shortly because there is a part of, not the visual pathway, but part of the light reflex that in, involves this area here. So why does any of this matter? Why would a clinician want to know the organization of this? When you have lesions at certain places within the visual pathway, they will produce specific visual field deficits that then can be used diagnostically to determine where this patient possibly had, um, had some sort of lesion. So we look first at position one, and we see that it is a lesion anterior to the optic chiasm, and so it is only impacting the nerves of one eye so in that instance, depending on whether, here we have it as a right side example, but it could also be on the left side. Whichever side, if it's anterior to the optic chiasm, it's going to produce unocular or monocular blindness. And so that is, again, we're not seeing any of those crossed fibers and it's, it's anterior to where we would have bilateral effect. So here, if we look, then we could also see a lesion at position two. Those are fairly common because the pituitary gland sits very close to there. And so we do see that very often. If you notice, when it's a lesion at the optic chiasm, it's only impacting those central nasal retinal fibers. And so in that instance, we would have bitemporal hemianopia. The reason it's bitemporal is because though the fibers are nasal, remember that the nasal fibers of both sides project to the temporal. Here, right here, right here. And so that is where you would see the deficit. If we had a lesion at position three, then we're dealing with fibers that are posterior to the optic chiasm we can see that that lateral 40%, which again, the number doesn't matter. So we can see that lateral bundle of fibers is going out to the temporal field. And then the medial bundle is crossing at the optic chiasm and continuing on to the contralateral nasal field. And so if it's impacting, as we were saying before, left, right, nasal, temporal, if it's posterior to the optic chiasm, it's gonna be impacting this nasal field on the right, this nasal field on the right as well, and both of those are controlling the left hemifield of our visual field. And so we're going to have the deficit then there on the left of each eye. And it's homonymous, so that means it is going to be the same on each as opposed to contralateral. And so now we have, where are we? Okay, so now we've got position four. 
it's a little strange the way this is drawn. And so it looks as if that would be the superior, but it's not. This is Myers loop. So that's the lower bundle for upper vision. And then this is actually the upper bundle, which is Baum's loop for the lower field of vision. So if we have a lesion here at position four, Myers loop, upper field of vision, we know we're going to have a deficit in the upper field. But then we also have to consider, because we said between the lateral geniculate nucleus and the primary visual cortex, we're dealing now not only with up and, or sorry, left and right, we're also dealing with up and down. And so in this case, we're going to see bilateral quadrantinopia. Anopia, I guess is more accurate, quadrantinopia. And so um, this would produce the deficit then in both sides in this upper, in this case, upper left quadrant. And then the exact same would be true if we saw a deficit here on Baum's loop, which remember is the upper loop, but it's the lower field of vision. And so you would see then the um, lower quadrantinopia of the on bilateral sides. Here is if you have a lesion back close, closer to the um, primary visual cortex, then you're going to see another situation like we saw here with lesion three. You're going to have homonymous hemianopia. And again, it will depend and be opposite to the side that is affected. So if the lesion's on the right, you're going to have the um, anopia on the left. And if the lesion's on the left, you'll have it on the right. Here we have the vasculature. And the reason to talk about the vasculature is because that is one of the main causes of why you would have these lesions occur. So it's some sort of um, stroke or aneurysm that is impacting then the blood flow to a specific area. So just a review, you have your ophthalmic artery here that services the retina and the optic nerve. Then you have your anterior choroidal artery here that is in green. That services the optic tract and the lateral geniculate nucleus. You have your deep optic branch here, and that is going to serve the optic radiations. And then here, this last one is somewhat important because you have basically double blood supply to the primary vi visual cortex, a redundant supply. So you have your posterior cerebral artery coming in here and your middle cerebral artery coming in there. Now that's also significant because there can be a case where you would see homonymous hemianopia, but you would see macular sparing. So that center of vision, the macula, is unaffected. It's still intact and still has its normal acuity. The reason for this is because of this redundant supply, but also because the macula is the highest represented on the primary visual cortex because it's the place of the highest acuity. You have the most representation in the primary visual cortex. For that reason and also for the redundant blood supply, at times a lesion you would still see the macula intact or spared while still having that visual field de deficit on the opposite side. One final thing to talk about when we're discussing lesions is Wilbrand's knee. This is part of normal development, but essentially when you see the nasal retinal fibers going posteriorly, through the optic chiasm and then proceeding on to the optic tract, some of the nasal, so the ones that are crossing, not these lateral ones here, but some of the nasal fibers, in fact, the inferior ones, will kind of tuck up into the contralateral optic nerve side for a moment. And so a lesion in that location will act just as we saw in the monocular or the uniocular anopia, where you have full vision loss to the affected side, but you'll also see upper left visual field quadrantinopia, and that's in this example, but it'll basically always be that upper outer visual field.
finally, we need to talk about the light reflex. So in addition to what we were discussing previously, where we see we have our visual field, retinal fields coming back to the lateral geniculate nucleus before coming out as optic radiations here. Just before the lateral geniculate nucleus, some uh, nerve fibers will kind of jump off toward the midbrain and they will synapse here, which is the pretectal area, but it's near the superior colliculi on each side. Let me see if I can make this a little larger for you so it's easier. I apologize for the graininess. Um, so anyhow, so these fibers will come. They will synapse here at the pretectal nucleus. And then each side will send a fiber to the Edinger westfall nucleus, which is the origin of the oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve three. And so you see the right pretectal area is sending fibers to both sides, as is the left sending areas, I'm sorry, fibers to both sides. And so this is important because when you have stimulus coming in in the form of light and your pupils need to respond, they do so consensually. And so shining in a normal reaction, shining light into the right eye should constrict the pupils of both eyes. And the way that this is possible is because once this occurs and the stimulus has come to the pretectal area, it's gone to, so let's say it comes in the right eye, you've, you've shown a light in your right eye, it's sent the signal now to both edinger westfall nuclei, at which point the oculomotor nerve is going to pick that up, head anteriorly, and run alongside the optic nerve, but not, not with it, not in it. Um, so it's gonna continue, synapse here at the ciliary ganglion, and then it's going to proceed forward and stimulate either the pupil to contract or, um, or dilate, depending on what is occurring. So when we shine a light into one eye, let's in this case the right eye, and the pupil constricts, that's what we call a direct response. Because of what is occurring here in the midbrain with the oculomotor nerve, that response is then also being received by the left eye in the form of an indirect response. So what happens if there's a lesion somewhere in this pathway? Let me move this so you can see better. There we go. All right, so if you look here, we've got the light, the stimulus coming in the right eye, and the lesion is there at the right eye. So the light goes in, the information, if you're shining in the right eye, never has a chance to make it back here and to synapse and create a response. However, because of that consensual response, even if a person had a lesion here and we were to shine a light in the left eye, the pathway would be unimpeded and then you would see a constriction, a normal constriction as shown here of both eyes or both pupils rather. If there's a lesion at position B, so this is now we've received our stimulus. We don't have a lesion here in this scenario. We've continued back to the lateral geniculate nucleus, then on to the pretectal area, forward to the Ed edinger westfall nucleus. And so remember that the pretectal area sends fibers to both of these edinger westfall nuclei. Well, this one is not gonna go anywhere because there's a lesion there. However, this one, there should be a normal response. And so in this scenario, with a lesion at area B and stimulus going into the right eye, you're going to see no change to the affected eye, but you will see constriction, normal constriction of the unaffected side. Then the exact same response would occur 
unlike in this first uh, example A, the exact same thing would occur if you shown the light in the left eye in this case, because once again, the, the initial part of the pathway is intact in both cases. It's only once we reach the uh, Edinger-Westphal nucleus that we have some sort of impairment here on the right side. So that is an overview of all I had for you guys. Thank you so much for listening. I hope it helped. Um, here I have, this was just a really helpful resource for me. It's kind of a one-stop shop on all this information, um, you know, in a pretty user-friendly way. I also like this one because here it has the breakdown of the layers of the LGN, which I think is gonna be in the next lecture that you'll learn about that, but it's just a helpful thing. And then here also is just a review of terms that we went over. Thank you guys again and stay safe.